everybody can hear me. So welcome to the last panel of the day. Uh, my name is Becky Cazor, and I'm an engineering fellow at Applegate. And I'm going to introduce everybody on the panel because we're going to talk about nuanced solutions. And it's a very diverse group and diverse set of topics that are going to talk about also. Once we introduce them, I'll let them each go through the presentation and then we'll open it up for a few minutes. So starting off here to my left is Pedro D. Marketing. Try not to uh, murder anybody's name here. He graduated less than two years ago and uh, has a double master's degree. He then developed his master's thesis of an internship at NASA JPL and now works at the Italian company AIKO in Turin. They are doing cutting edge artificial intelligence for space missions. Uh, he also strongly believes that uh, progress in the space sector can guarantee um, the applied to uh, progress on the Earth. Next to him is uh, Ralph Dinsley, or Dins, as he likes to be called. Uh, he is an RAF veteran with more than 32 years of service in the air defense. He then continued in space surveillance and tracking and SSA roles until he retired in 2017, at which point he was bored and decided <laughs> to start his own company called North and was acquired by Raytheon last summer. He's a, a proactive proponent of space sustainability and the development of a truly circular space plan. Next to him is uh, Mauricio and Scott. They are going to present together. Uh, Scott Dorrington is a postdoc researcher. He received a doctorate in astrodynamics from the University of South or New South Wales and focused on the technical and economic stability of asteroid mining business, which we kind of touched on a little bit yesterday. And he currently works at the Space Enabled Group at the MIT Lab, from the MIT Media Lab. And they work on the development and implementation of space sustainability data. To the right of him is Mauricio Martinez Elizondo. And he is currently a senior here, majoring in aerospace engineering. He is then studying like satellite engineering, orbital mechanics, and also social sciences to kind of understand the role of space development in our economy and society. He then joined the space enabled group at the MIT Media Lab last summer and is also working on the uh, space, space sustainability data. And last but not least is Emma Lowry. Emma is our astrophysicist on the panel and she's been in love with space for a long time from studying the Milky Way and learning about the NASA rover. She graduated magna cum laude from Princeton University and was selected as a Brooks Bowling Fellow and a Quad Fellow. She's currently a PhD candidate at Princeton and studies the geometry of exoplanetary systems. So with that, we would like to start with your presentation. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Give me just one sec. Can you hear me? Sunshine, sleeping chair. Yeah. Thank you, thank you all. I'm glad to be. I'm glad to be here. Uh, I hope not bothering you too much. This last session, you know. Uh, I'm Pietro De Marchi. I am. Yeah, I'm Italian. I work at Michael, a small uh, startup in Italy. We're working on mainly uh, artificial intelligence uh, algorithms for uh, onboard application and ground applications too. Uh, but today, uh, I'm yeah. I will present to you uh, our research about an SSA STM uh, topic, particularly about um, yeah, let's say an original filtering technique for uh, the orbits, uh, trying to yeah, improve uh, performances in pre-filtering. So before the real uh, effective definition of uh, of conjunctions. Um, so it relies on uh, a simplified model again, and is specific for uh, the orbits. So uh, next slide, we have to do that, sorry. Okay, 
Um, just to recap briefly where we are. Um, so here, a very simplified uh, perspective of the uh, conjunction analysis pipeline. As we uh, heard yesterday uh, by um, by Clark during the last during the last panel, the first very important point is the definition of a reliable and complete catalog of orbits um, wherever we are we are computing conjunction. So mainly in Leo because it's really a uh, congested environment, we know. And uh, after that, there's a, a pre-filtering or filtering uh, procedure of uh, all the uh, all the possible couple uh, couples of orbits uh, considered for uh, the conjunctions, trying to uh, exclude uh, couples not producing for sure any type of conjunction. Um, and after that, the, there's the precise definition of uh, conjunction, and after that, collision data message, etc. Uh, so here. Um, yeah, the representation of the data set we are talking about and uh, that we have used for the final uh, all versus all assessment of conjunction uh, detections. Uh, here we have considered this uh, subset of um, Leo TLEs, as you can uh, see from the two from the two plots. Um, yeah, the most important point is uh, about the second plot, so the, the values of eccentricities. Uh, you know they are very uh, low for the great majority of uh, orbits in this in this region. In particular, I want to highlight yes the uh, the great a great amount of orbits as eccentricity um, very small and less than zero point zero zero five. Okay, here we are trying to go through uh, the models. I re I will remain sufficiently. Let's say high level, uh, you will find all the mathematical uh, details and explanations in the uh, paper. Uh, the, um, the algorithm, as I said before, relies on a simplified orbital model. We're trying to understand if this simplified model can effectively uh, carry some uh, advantages in this, in this analysis. It is recovered from uh, the Claudius Ptolemy uh, formulation. Uh, Claudius Ptolemy, of course, is a, a, an ancient uh, Roman astronomer and mathematician. Uh, and in his um, Almagest, he described this planetary model, which was for uh, planets uh, orbiting around Earth. And in this case, we, we just recovered the, the deference, or in this case, simply the off-centric circle um, for the uh, Keplerian uh, orbit, so the elliptical orbit, and we use this simplified geometry to set up the, our uh, filter or algorithm uh, composed of different tests trying to uh, exclude uh, as much capital as possible uh, from harder and more, um, let's say, long and precise uh, analysis for the, for the conjunction. So starting from uh, yeah, the inputs of the inputs of the filter are, of course, the thresholds used for the conjunction analysis and the orbital data. Deferents are recovered uh, through using mean elements for each orbit, and they are uh, passed through the filter in an all versus all analysis. So basically, comparing all the um, yeah all the couples. Okay, so here are the main uh, takeaways. For yeah, let's say the, the final analysis um, employment of this algorithm uh, in the in the catalog we have considered, um, um, we have to say that this uh, this algorithm and the and the simplified model particularly uh, suits Lee orbits uh, as we have seen before because of the small eccentricity. So the uh, different model is really uh, close uh, to the effective uh, Keplerian formulation. Considering this algorithm in this all versus all analysis uh, with the catalog considered, the uh, some uh, the, the total amount of conjunction is effectively identified as compared with the with a very well known uh, benchmark. So in this case, it was considered a combination of the Hoots Perigian WB um, pre filter and Gronkis uh, uh, Moid. Um, so. Yeah, effectively, it is effectively capable to identify all the uh, all the possible uh, conjunction or the one detected by the, the benchmark, and but it considered some couples, some couples more, of course. 
Um, the real advantage are 0.2 and 0.3, so which is very it is very fast. It is two times uh, faster than the benchmark. And um, the first, the very first two tests are capable to exclude a great amount of uh, couples from further analysis. Um, and since uh, the last point is that since it considers um, the mean elements, so uh, also the history of, of the perturbation is could be effectively interesting for part of developments about, about that. So next step are for sure to um, yeah include this algorithm in AI-based pipeline um, for of course always uh, projection analysis. Uh, in later we have some example we would like to try to understand if this alternative model could uh, contribute in improving yeah, again the these performances and add the uh, computation of precise model location, which is not included in the, in the model itself yet. Okay, this is, this is the end, thank you. Uh, I will leave the, the floor to the next presenter. Is this on? It is, yeah. thank you very much. Just waiting here for the, uh, the slides to appear. Um, good afternoon, everybody. First, I'd like to thank um, the organizers for both inviting myself uh, to participate and to present at this conference. Uh, and second, more importantly, I'd like to thank them for the richness and diversity of the presentations we've received over the past two days. It certainly has been a, a wonderful event. A lot of food for thought, um, a lot of uh, diverse information, and sadly to me, it's actually detracting me slightly from my presentation. So I've added a little bit to start with just to diverge slightly. Um, but today I come to you as what I was told never to class myself as, but as an SSA evangelist. Um, I was a military air defense specialist uh, in the early parts of my career, what was known as a fighter controller. We, we became known as aerospace battle managers. So there's always space in my title. Um, and I, I choose that career by through choice um, and stumbled into space surveillance and tracking by complete accident. Um, so today I want to offer you an alternative lens to consider for the future of both management, traffic and space, uh, and how we actually collect that data. During my 32 years career in the uh, Royal Air Force, I frequently came across the classic uh, answer, or sorry, the classic question to why are you doing it like that as, well, we've always done it that way. Uh, a lot of that time was during my career side on, on the space surveillance side of things as well, because it was entrenched in myself warning. So I want people to consider that thought and to keep that in your mind as, as I speak this afternoon to think about what's been said over the past two days as well. Yesterday, Dr. Ruth Stilwell offered up the concept of air traffic management policy to support the development of future space traffic management. And this morning, Richard DiBello even continued the uh, air versus space analogy. Um, our airspace truly would be crowded. We still had aircraft up there from the 1960s. Um, but first, the diversion piece. Yesterday, I was uh, thinking from some of the original presentations, just got me thinking of the composition of these events we go to. The fact that um, it's often very same people or similar people. Uh, there is a lot of diversity amongst them, but we're always missing some of the key players, some of the key actors, China, Russia, India, for, for fact, often don't appear at these events. So I think what we need is a, a forum to rapidly influence and to accelerate global SDM. Um, despite the sterling work of conferences like this and uh, organizations like the Secure World Foundation, um, are we really getting the right influences in the right place? And that's a question we should continue to ask ourselves. Has anybody here heard of Isadaka? It was born um, out of the Pugwash Committee, which was a scientific organization that began in the 1950s. Um, Isidarko is basically a series of residential courses on the problem of international security, um, arms control, and disarmament that's held in northern Italy. And apart from the location, it's held at the fact it's held in January, and therefore, between the morning and evening sessions, people go skiing or snowboarding. Um, it is a wonderful organization that brings together 10 to 15 senior lecturers and between 30 and 40 junior researchers using the casual and friendly atmosphere to discuss current topics in science. Ten years ago, I was fortunate uh, as a military officer um, to attend one of their peace schools as one of the junior researchers. 
Um, you can do the maths 10 years ago. How junior could I have been? Um, but the course I was on was discussing new military technologies and their implications for strategic, for strategy and arms control. Um, it was a lot of it was focused around drone warfare. There was senior representation from uh, universities in the US, um, from Russia, and from China. So actually, some of the key players that we want in space were in there. Um, and I was privy at times between some of the presentations to actually watch the formulation of international influence, particularly at the time of non-nuclear proliferation, amongst, particularly amongst the US and uh, Russian delegates that were there. And you could tell, my, my, my supervisor instructed me that um, these, the, these discussions, these individuals went back to their, host, their, their countries and then spoke to senior politicians and drove that, that influence. So you know, there's a, a, a way of, yes, we've always done things, we've had these conferences, we've always done it that way, but maybe then we need to have a new angle to help speed up that global peace. But I diverted a bit too much and for a bit too long. Um, so we're really into the, the reasons that uh, I'm here and here to talk. And let's see if I get this the right way around. Yes, that's good. That was always a good start. So back on track, I'd like to introduce you to another air traffic analogy to guide how we create space traffic management. Introduce you through the lens of the aerospace battle manager. Historically for space management, for space safety, the military have got it for us. Um, I believe we currently over rely on the sterling work that the US DOD do to support what we need to do for the future. It's great to see the Department of Commerce developing their space traffic ideals, but how long has that been coming? I remember the FAA talking about their pilot program, which never made uh, surface because of changes in, in politics. That was six to eight years ago. So it's been a long, long process and we need to be quicker. I personally believe we need a civil space to take over the space safety role and to look after the background noise so that our military personnel can look after the security of space. Since 1950s, as radar capabilities improved, the UK developed a National Air Traffic Service, NATS for short, which actually when somebody wrote a paper on that two years ago in the UK, an op-ed, it caused quite a stir in the uh, space community because it mentioned the word national, and of course space is global, but why not have a GNATS or whatever for space traffic management, the most important thing. NATS might have been formed nationally, but it interlinks internationally, so it's quite important. The, surface, the service today supports all the civil space traffic over the UK airspace, manages everything that comes into, out of, um, and lands in the UK, um, the background noise of airspace. Um, and they use secondary surveillance radars communicating with the aircraft transponders. So it's looking after those that stick to the norms of behavior of airspace. And it's familiar there. In the meantime, the Royal Air Force, my original career stream, maintained the integrity of the UK airspace, the security, and they utilize primary. So they have tools specific for each job to support the missions. How do we do space surveillance mostly at the moment? Oh, we have missile warning tools that are optimized to look for missiles, not for look to satellites. Maybe we should be funding civil sources to do that role, to support it. Civil space traffic management to look after the background noise so that the military can focus in on the nefarious actors and provide the security of space. But moving on from that um, space, traffic management concept and looking more at how we get the data to support the management. We've always used radar for Leo and optical for Geo. Well, I suggest let's look at it through a different lens. How else can we do this work? And I'd like to introduce you here to Loki, the Leo optical camera installation. Developed through a UK space agency grant fund called Advancing SST. My original company, Northern Space and Security, or Norse, what is now UK Raytheon's, uh, Raytheon UK's Raytheon Norse, uh, developed a cost effective way to try and track, or should I say, surveil um, objects in Leo. Before everybody cries out, but radar is best for Leo, I must emphasize one of the key elements of the research was cost effective. And I give you, if somebody can tell me a cheap radar, let's go for it. But uh, the difference in cost is phenomenal. Loki utilizes commercial off-the-shelf systems comprising three cameras and, and lenses, CMOS cameras, uh, one, one, one narrow field of view lens, two wide field of view lenses. It's giving a whole sky view, but the narrow field giving you more accuracy and more importantly, an additional mission to do object characterization through deep light curve analysis. 
including the observatory and a base, a hard standing, it can be deployed for less than 60,000 pounds. So very, very cost effective. And where needed can be married to both sustainable sources of energy, solar panels or wind turbines. In fact, one we have deployed in Northumberland uses a wind turbine through the Kilda Observatory. Or they can be plugged into the grid, quite simply. Collecting 10 second frames of approximately 122 millimeters, uh, megabytes in size during its operation. All the processing is done on site. In-depth processing can be done elsewhere. And at the bare minimum, track data messages are generated that can be transmitted at kilobytes out for catalog maintenance. Our first site is operating in Kilda in Northumberland, which is one of the remotest parts of England. Um, and has been operating since December uh, 21. And it's taken more than 12,000 observations um, on over 3,000 large objects in Leo, Neo, and Heo, large objects, some background noise. In fact, the first object we tracked was Debbie, and it was a US um, weather satellite uh, that was now um, defunct or derelict, or whichever form we want to call it. Um, the original idea of the operation was to take Three hours of observations after sunset, three hours before sunrise. But foolishly, the scientists let me play with one of the prototype lenses in my backyard, literally in my room. I can put it out from my garage. I have a hard drive to drive it from, which annoys my wife because I end up spending even more time in the garage, not on a motorbike, but looking at what we're tracking and what we're seeing. Um, but the location where I get to play with the prototype is about 45 miles away from Kilda. And I was able to push the boundaries. We discovered at the latitude that we're at, which is about 54, 55 north, um, we actually pick up a lot of objects in those gaps between sunset and sunrise. Um, those that don't fall behind the, uh, the Earth's shadow. Um, large rocket bodies, Molnaya orbits, uh, up, and, and more recently we've discovered a number of MIDAS um, satellites, 1960s infrared missile warning satellites are up at over 3,000 3, plus kilometers. So by running through the night, because it's so cost effective, we can pick up a lot more information. But of course, one site is limited by geography. And Northern England weather does play uh, a hard role in it. Yes, I'd like it to be sunnier, but actually sometimes the clouds keep all the tourists away from our beautiful beaches, so I don't complain. Um, but what if we could deploy them in significant numbers? That first step is actually working with uh, a close partnership with Exxon Analytics Solutions to deploy three camera configuration out to 30 plus observatories. For significantly lot, a lot less than the cost of a single radar, we can deploy hundreds of locations globally and we can uh, focus on the large objects, allowing the radars to be focusing on smaller objects. We can remove that background noise. Using the optical and radar data will provide an effective alternative to how we collect data today. Um, and to put it very simply, a fully deployed Loki will provide a sustainable way to effectively support space sustainability. And that's going to loop on me now instead of going on to the next slide. There we go. Thank you very much for your time. Hi, um, so I'm Scott. I'm from uh, MIT. I'm here with my colleague. Hi, uh, I'm Mauricio. I'm, I go to UT Austin, but I, I was in the summer uh, at MIT at the Media Lab. Thank you. Cool. Um, yeah, so today we're here to talk about um, uh, measuring dis distances between satellites and different ways that you can do that. Um, and so one of the, the methods that we're looking at is um, the applicability of using uh, specific angular momentum coordinates uh, to the vectors of that. Uh, so a bit of background about why we're interested in this. Um, so this is related to work on space sustainability rating. Um, so we've heard a, a couple of mentions of it um, over the past two days, um, which is great. Um, for those that don't know, it's a sort of a rating system to measure how sustainable a spacecraft mission is. So there's different modules. Um, each one uh, sort of quantifying metrics um, in different aspects of the, the satellite mission. Um, so us at MIT and UT Austin are um, working on the DIT module, um, which is stands for the detectability, identifiability, and trackability. 
So it's trying to quantify how easy it is to detect, track, and identify a satellite um, from ground-based observations. So the detectability and trackability are currently implemented in the system as it is, um, but there's no metric yet for identifiability. So we're wanting to develop a metric to be able to quantify how easy it is to identify a particular satellite from uh, nearby objects that could be confused with. Uh, so we're looking at two approaches to this. So looking at uh, measure, different measures of the distance between um, sort of similar close orbits, uh, and also related looking at the density around that object. So you know, objects that have a uh, low density around them, there's going to be fewer objects to, to be able to like confuse them with. So that's the thing around that. Uh, so there's different ways to you know, um, convey positions and, and distances in, in space. Uh, so it depends on what parameter space you're using to, um, to plot your positions, um, and also how you define measuring distance stack space. Um, so we typically think about measuring distances as just a straight line, um, but that's not the only way. So you can measure sort of curved paths. So if you think about um, measuring the path of a plane around the world, you kind of measure the curvature of the Earth. Really. Um, so it wouldn't really make sense to measure the Earth. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we've been looking at um, using specific angle of momentum coordinates. Um, so you can sort of plot things in um, all the elements, um, but you have problems with that that you know the, the different orbital elements have different scales. Um, so you kind of have to like scale them and decide how how you're gonna scale them. Uh, angular momentum coordinates are useful in that um, you can uh, you know they, they all have consistent measurements and scales. Um, and they they capture a lot of the um, the information about the alignment of the orbital plane. Um, and since most orbits are in circular orbits, um, you don't lose a lot of information when you're so going from six degrees for each three parameters. Uh, and so two of the, um, the key properties of um, angular momentum coordinates is if you look at the, the Z component of it, it's directly proportional to inclination. Um, and in polar coordinates, the, the theta component, so the, the angle around the circle is related to the direction of the ascending node. Uh, so this is what it looks like if you plot the current space object catalog uh, in the angular momentum coordinates. Um, so you see this interesting structure. Um, so you see the, it's, you know, we, we see these concentric rings that are separated in the, the Z component. Um, so each of these are distinct um, orbital planes, so orbital inclinations that are um, well used. Um, so you can see that you know it's it's a good way to to kind of try to segment up the um, the orbital space. Um, and in each each of these rings, there's a there's an even distribution of um, of ascending nodes. Uh, yeah, so we, in previous work, we've been looking at um, applying density estimation methods. Um, so quantifying the density of these objects, um, and you can start to identify like really high density clusters. And if you um, apply some sort of uh, cutoff values, you can plot them into sort of high, medium, and low uh, objects, and you can you know, identify each of these high density objects back to um, you know, no collision events. Uh, yeah, so we've been looking at the applicability of this as like a, a metric for identifiability. Um, and in this work, we wanted to, to look further into it to try to measure um, you know, different distance metrics. So previously, we were just using straight line Euclidean distance. Um, so we wanted to try some maybe curved distances that account for this, this curvature of the distribution. Um, and also, this is um, currently just the distribution at a single time. So we wanted to understand how objects move in this space over time. Yeah, so just to re reiterate that, uh, for this work, we're gonna be focusing on the motion of these objects over time. So we want to be able to determine a metric that can describe the natural motion of these satellites. To do this, we're gonna be extracting the historic TLEs of over one, a one year period. Uh, this is using the space track data, which I know you are familiar with since it has been mentioned plenty of times during this conference. So to, to be able to do this, this analysis, we're going to be, be doing a statistical analysis of the variations in XR, XC, and X theta, uh, which are the, the different components of the angular momentum and cylindrical coordinates. So we're gonna be starting by looking at the HR and HC components. 
As you can see in that plot on the top, uh, we can see an obvious trend of small fluctuations between the HR values. Uh, you can also see some extreme outliers in the data. Um, then to, to be able to continue with our analysis, we tried uh, one outlier removal method to kind of under understand how the, the data set behave. So what we did is we used the median absolute deviation and we removed points that had a, uh, had a value higher than 3.5 match from the median. We use the median because it's a more robust, uh, it's a more robust metric than the mean. And as you can see in that plot on the bottom, after one iteration of this outlier removal method, uh, we got rid of most of the extreme outliers because the, the variation in HR was a lot less than the mean of HR. So these were the results that we found for HR and doing the same kind of process, we found a similar results for the HC component. From this, we were able to conclude that the HC and the HR are approximately constant over time. Then we continued by looking at the H data component. So as you can see in those plots in the bottom, uh, we, can, we can divide the data set between three sets of motion. So the red uh, plot shows the satellites or the objects that are moving in a, in a prograde orbit, which shows a linearly, linearly decreasing H data value. Then for the retrograde, which is the blue, uh, we see a linearly increasing value of H data. And then we have these other objects which seem to oscillate over time when it comes to their H data value. So after doing that and understanding that we have like three different categories in the sense, we try to connect this measured value with the theoretical uh, nodal precession rate of the nodes, which is due to the J2 effect. And that plot on the top uh, shows how there's a direct connection between the theoretical precession Session rate of the nodes and what we were able to observe through this statistical analysis. So on this slide, we can see like a 3D picture that shows what we just discussed. It's similar to the previous slide that we showed of the, the 3D angular momentum space. You can see this like concentric rings, and you can see that we have different values of HC and also of of the H theta. So there are different th there are different rings for uh, the prograde, the re the retrograde and the very the oscillation motion uh, in H theta. And from this ring from these rings and from the structure that we can see in the motion of the satellites, we were able to conclude that cylindrical coordinates are an ideal system to measure distances since we are able to kind of understand the natural motion between the satellites, and then we can start to define uh, uh, identifiable metric from that. Yeah, um, so the next step was to um, try to look at how uh, different um, distance metrics that we can use in, in these cylindrical coordinates. Um, so we wanted to go for you know, simple analytical um, functions that can measure the distance between two endpoints. Um, uh, so the first one we used was the Euclidean distance. Um, so just as a, as a baseline to compare it with. Uh, so the second one was uh, using the concept of the, the arc length of the circle. So you're measuring like around the circle. So similar to the great arc distance. Uh, so to do that, we used um, the, the mean um, HR component between the two endpoints um, and the, the angle around the, the circle. Um, we counted for, um, you know, the, the two possible ways that you can measure the angle around it. So taking the, the minimum of it. Um, the third component is um, sort of extending that to three coordinates. Um, so we, we added the the dis, dis, uh, the change in the, the rate of component and the Z component. Um, so in a similar fashion that you would in the Euclidean distance. Uh, so this, this plot here shows um, just the, the Euclidean distance of, um, a test object, so it's at the, the center of that uh, red point. So you can see that you know, nearby distances are, um, you know, have, have very small distances. Um, right, if we zoom in on, um, just take the ring that that um, midpoint is on, so looking at it from the top, uh, we can compare the cylind this cylindrical distance to the Euclidean distance. Uh, you can see that they're, they're fairly similar distributions, um, so it's 
you know, links up to what we you know, typically think about distance. Um, the, the value ranges are, are fairly similar. Um, but the, the key distinction is in, uh, when we think about measuring distances between points that are separated by 180 degrees. Um, so the Euclidean distance would measure across the circle, um, whereas the cylindrical distance measure around the circle. Um, so you get a much even, a much more even distribution uh, in the cylindrical distance mode. Uh, so if we plot the, the values against each other, um, you can see that at small distances, they're, they're fairly similar. Um, and it really diverges for um, you know, distances that are at that 180 degree separation. Yeah, I think since we're out of time, uh, these are the conclusions that we found, which is basically just a summary of what we have discussed. And I think we should go continue with future work. Yeah, um, so there's a couple of things that we can try um, to do. So we want to um, so update the previous density estimation methods that we're using to use these, um, these new distance metrics. Um, continue the development of the identifiability metric or the SSR. So we want to you know, do some more tests to, to make sure that we you know, come to a you know, a, a good understanding of, of what um, metric we should we want to implement. Um, also, we want to consider um, measuring distances that account for different epochs. Um, so, if we want to like sort of link things back to uh, potential um, objects, we may want to um, you know look at an observation now and try to link it back to possible objects that it could come from. Um, and looking at other applications for these distance metrics, um, so you can do things like. Um, Use it as a, a proxy for estimating delta v's and maneuvers, um, and you know, monitoring distances of um, different uh, inclination planes, um, and yeah, other things. So yeah, thank you. Now, there we go. Okay, cool. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for sticking through to the end of this conference. I'm well aware that I'm the last presentation standing between you and more coffee and maybe an afternoon nap. So hopefully we'll try and keep you entertained with something very different than what we've been hearing um, for a lot of the other presentations at this conference that hopefully present a different perspective on space traffic management and SSA and from a different perspective. I am an astrophysicist. I study exoplanets. So I spend most of my nights, um, let's see if this is going to go click forward. Where should I be pointing? Where's the monitor? Okay, yeah, thank you. Maybe. So, cool. Maybe. <laughs> cool. So that is what I really care about is this night sky where we can get lots of data for planets that are outside of our solar system. That's my specific domain expertise is I look at orbital architectures of exoplanetary systems and the impacts of tides on how these systems change and what that can tell us about planetary formation and evolution. So why on earth am I here at this conference talking? I'm here because my presentation and part of this nuanced solution for or participation on the nuanced solutions panel here is because I think that one of the key parts of this is making sure that everybody who is both interested and a stakeholder in this problem is in these conversations. And a key group in the um, STM world is astronomers. We care a lot about what's up there in the sky and we care a lot about keeping it clean. Um, so what the data that I do or data that I work with goes toward is a lot of objectives that are laid out by these documents, which are the decadal surveys. They're produced every 10 years by the National Academies and they have been since the 1960s. And these documents are critical for astronomy because they guide how NASA and NSF look for their funding. Um, they lobby Congress based on the objectives that are put together in these decadal reports that have been around since the 1960s. They're fundamental for picking what is going to happen next in the night sky, what we're going to be looking for most, where astronomy's money is going to go. And they've been a really powerful tool for laying out objectives that the entire community can agree upon and act upon. Um, for example, the James Webb Space Telescope is one that came out of a decadal survey from, I think, 2000. So it's been a 20 year in the process to get something that was an objective in one of these surveys into the sky. 
So that's where SSA work and STM work comes into the astronomy. Because if you go to the next slide, we've been putting together those decadal surveys in the context of unchanging sky. So between 1960, all the way even really to 2010, those kind of surveys were effective because they could look forward and assume that the night sky would look the same way. But now we're in this era where the number of active satellites is growing and then debris is growing on top of that. So when we plan a decadal survey, we can no longer assume that the night sky is going to be unchanging. And that is where astronomy meets STM. And that's why I'm here talking to you today. The other part of this is that not a lot of astronomers are aware of a plot like this. If you read through the most recent decadal survey, you'll find less than 10 mentions of satellites in the context of astronomy, in spite of the document calling for the creation of telescopes that are all ground-based that would be 30 meters in diameter and would be dramatically impacted by, the by all of these satellites. Um, so that's where my project here is going to come in. You can go to the next slide, please. So I'm really interested in the fact that we have all these observatories on the ground. We have all these planned observatories that are very large and also great examples of astronomers' lack of creativity in naming things. <laughs> um, and they are ones that we're thinking about right now that are recommended in the decadal survey or have been agreed upon by the community, but that are going to be impacted by all of these satellite constellations. But if you go into an average astronomy department and you ask around, most people aren't going to be aware of the Starling constellations of OneWeb, they're going to suggest that maybe it's a little bit of a problem for near-Earth asteroids, or maybe it's going to be a problem for radio astronomy, where it's a little bit harder to pinpoint the noise and the data and get it back out. But um, by and large, astronomers aren't really thinking about how this is going to impact our field long term. There is a couple of, there are a couple of organizations like within the IAU that are thinking about this. I don't want to discount the important work that they've done. But what I want to think about is what does this mean for the future of astronomy? And how can we strategically plan for a new world in the context of these satellite constellations? What can we think about that would go in these decadal surveys that would be different than what we've seen in past years when we don't have a static sky? So that's why I'm creating HypaSat, which you can go to the next slide, is a tool for astronomers to be able to understand why and how our sky is changing. It's the idea is to have a very visual tool so that astronomers can go and just understand the basic impact. It's a very like ground level, just communication tool to be able to talk about what's happening in the night sky from a page where everybody has the same sort of understanding. Um, this tool is created through a NASA space grant. I'm working to try and write a paper that will capture the SMD priorities in the context of these constellations. And then from there, we're going to be building a scale to say which astronomy priorities are most impacted by satellite constellations, and therefore, which ones do we need to start thinking about new solutions for most quickly. Go to the next slide. It's built to be very simple. Like I said, it's built upon easily accessible open source tools and open source data. We're using um, GitHub, Streamlit, Jupyter, and then some work that was done by Samantha Lawler, Aaron Woolley, and Hanu Rain to measure visibility predictions. And then we're going to be able to put it in all the new constellations and various predictions for the amount of satellites that are going to be in the sky in the future and be able to see what can that look like for your favorite observatory. So if you go to the next slide, two forward, sorry. <laughs> this is a simple model of what it's going to look like. I just started this research this spring, so it's still in its infancy. But it's going to be a very simple, very visual, but really understandable tool to be able to understand what's going to happen in the night sky. So you can go in, put in a date, put in a location, and get a general prediction of how many satellites are going to be illuminated above. Of course, we make no guarantees that any of this is going to be 100%, but we can do it relatively reliably based on filings, the credible filings, and the idea is to get astronomers into the conversation with this, which is critical for a future where we all can advocate together. So to kind of summarize the whole story here, all of our previous planning in astrophysics has been based upon a static sky, but that static sky is no more. Astronomers are not prepared for, to put our future science into context with these constellations, and we need a strategy if we want to achieve our bold science goals, because I don't know about you, but every time I look at pictures from these telescopes or I hear about the data or I see the data myself and use it, we know that the goals of astronomy are really important for learning about where we are in a cosmic context. So 
we want to do these bold science goals, but we need to figure out how to do it in the context of constellations because constellations also aren't going anywhere. So our solution to start is Hypasat, which is our interactive visual tool, publicly available, easily accessible, found in the astro literature, which is critical because there is a lot of literature out there about satellite constellations, but it's just not where astronomers are reading it. Um, and then encouraging astronomers to be creative in solutions. If we understand the context that we're going to be in, where can we put our telescopes? How can we make them? How can we partner with commercial entities to be able to design new ways to make telescopes? And how can we kind of reimagine astronomy in the context of the space world? Uh, benefits is that we're going to get an understanding of the story of the future space environment so that strategists can incorporate these changes and we can tell the story of the space environment and the need to keep it clean for the future. Just as much as satellite operators want to keep a clean space environment, we also want a clean space environment because the cleaner it is, the easier it is for us to get rid of the satellite tracks in our data. And to address debris, we really need all stakeholders to be invested. Astronomers are a key stakeholder, and right now, a minority of them are even aware of this issue. So to get the field engaged, we're building Hypasat and bringing the astronomers into the conversation so that we can all creatively work toward the solutions that this whole conference has been about. Thank you. So before I open it up for audience q and I wanted to mention that the uh, the SPM organizing committee is going to say a few words after this, so we aren't done quite yet, so please hang around while we for a while. Um, do I have any audience questions? If not, I have some of my own questions. So coming from an astrophysics background, I can, I can tell you, you will find out that SSA is the red-headed stepchild of astronomy. Um, astronomers typically don't pay attention to it. And so there's a, a cultural gap yeah, um, exactly. that uh, might help fulfill it. It's diplomat in terms of two, two islands that uh, look in the sky using telescopes. That's exactly why I am interested in this, is that I got my toe into the space world as an undergrad and very quickly figured out that astronomers don't really talk to the space industry all that often. And I think that bridging the gap between those two islands is going to be critical for the future. Thank you. Okay, so I guess I'll start with my question. Oh, okay. well, let's go ahead. I, I had a question about the Loki uh, optical system. So I, I uh, am questioning, uh, is this a proposal to sell the telescope or to sell data from the telescopes? That's a very good question. Um, the simple answer is both. Um, it, I mean, anybody can buy the, the cameras and uh, lenses from commercial providers. Uh, at the end of the day, it's the, the secret source is the actual code for the processing and more important, the code for characterization piece. Um, Personally, uh, the aim was to, to sell both, to move both forward, because getting as many out there as possible has, has got to be the important thing. One thing I found in the early days, being a, uh, you know, having operated at RAF filing downs, being embedded in air defense radar, being a radar person, actually playing with the prototype outside my backyard drew me more and more into space tracking. I literally would step in the garage and flick through the frames to see if I could pick out the streaks in the early days before we actually had the processing done on board. Uh, now I go in there and check the TDMs and then start correlating it with the uh, with space track. Um, I need to to stop doing that because my wife gets annoyed about how long they spend at night time now out in the garage. But yes, yeah, so it's a very good system. So it's a great educational system. It's a great system to sell to astronomers so they can see those streets um, without having to without it getting in the way of the pictures. Um, but um, but the most important thing is to is to draw that data out to then start building a very specific catalog to be able to support. Safe operations. Is um, you might get some if you look up Los Alamos National Lab. They have a project called the Iron Telescope. If you're not familiar with that, it's been around for a dozen years. You might find some interesting parallels and some uh, inspiration from what they've been doing. I will do. Thanks. Yeah, if you want to get closer, I can introduce you. Yeah. Question for Pietro. And this kind of ties into the, the, the AI panel earlier today. Um, what what are you hoping to get out of AI and as it's you know applying to collision avoidance with your algorithm? I'm just curious to hear your thoughts. Where do you see that coming? Yeah. Just a question away from me. Yeah, um I I really think I'm I'm sending this uh, was a paper 
2021 by Stevenson and Fernandez, artificial intelligence for all versus all conjunction screening. So the uh, objective here could be to, yeah, again, to improve the pre-filtering or filtering phase before the effective definition of conjunction. So in a precise way. So, uh, so here artificial, as you know, much learning and uh, reinforcement learning could be uh, trained on large and reliable data sets and used to very quickly exclude a uh, big amount of conjunction. So let's say I see the advantage uh, in this sense, as we have discussed before, um, effectively artificial intelligence and in particular um, machine learning could be very useful for um, in the fields of SSA, STM. And it's sometimes uh, operators and companies have some difficulties uh, in understanding maybe the potential or trust the potential itself. But I think, yeah, in this case, where we are uh, we're going through um, a bigger increase in the number of satellites, mega constellation, et cetera, it would be really useful um, from a computational point of view to, to introduce such this type of algorithms at least in excluding the, the uh, filtering the great amount of couples. And after that, maybe go through more uh, transparent, let's say transparent uh, and precise analysis uh, or more classical. So I, I hope that answered the question. Thank you. Well, I have a question for Sarah. So you talked about the angle around the circle, the three circles, the cylindrical ball distance. Um, are you thinking that that could be used to enforce the degree of separation between satellites and you know allow it in the future to be like a uh, a gap or a safety measure? Could you say yeah. elaborate a little? Yeah, I think um that's yeah one possible application. Um, I think yeah with the it's probably going to be most useful in terms of separating uh, distinct inclination planes um, because you kind of lose information about individual satellites that may be in that plane. So it, it doesn't, um, when you like sample down from six orbital elements to the three uh, parameters, yeah, you're going to lose some information. Um, so it, it may be uh, useful in terms of these mega constellations that are planning you know, very precisely um, you know, separated inclination planes. So um, you know, if you need to maintain separation between those planes, then it, it may be a useful uh, metric to, to measure that and monitor it. Thank you. Um, Emma, can you tell us uh, about um, when you plan to roll out your data? Yes, so that will be out by this summer. Um, and then with it, we'll be following up with the scale for figuring out which cases in astronomy will be impacted most quickly um, and running from there with figuring out how to, what what strategies to go forward with for those different branches of astronomy. But by the summer is when it, the loves it will be live. Yeah. Okay, and that'll be uh, available like online on a website where anybody could go online. Yeah, but part of the idea with it is that beyond being like, there are a lot of um, tools out there that are live in, for example, GitHub repositories, which if you know how to install them on your computer and run them, they're extremely useful. But the idea with this is that all you have to do is type in a URL and you can go and visualize what's going to be over your favorite observatory. Yeah. Um, then, sorry, I have a, I'm full of questions. Um, since Raytheon has bought North from you, or you're part of them now, um, do you see an evolution in how that might be rolled out or used internally for uh, their future SSA type activities? Um, yes, absolutely. The, um, one of the reasons that um, we were um, keen on the investment, the acquisition from Raytheon, was the fact that we we reached that tipping point as a small small company. I mean, it was a vision to relieve my boredom to top up my pension and do a bit of part-time work when I retire from the military to create NORS. Um, I haven't quite got to that part-time work piece yet. Um, and, and within five years, we're a company of 25 personnel with Raytheon recognised with the only SSA provider in the UK uh, and acquired us. So the plan is to develop both our proprietary um, software system known as NORS Track, which is developed by analysts for analysts and Loki, 
to be able to create an extensive network globally. Um, rating is providing the initial investment in which we can deploy out to the EXO um, observatories. After that, we'll be building a lot more of our own observatories. Nearly the only factor is just our personnel resource at the moment. Thank you. Oh, Jesus, is your other Data sets, because I know you use um, select tracks as your you know available data for TLEs, and as with all the sets earlier, all your databases have like bad data or not as good data. Some have better than others. Um, have you thought about like pulling different data sets to find that? Yeah, this stage, uh, let's say, uh, yeah, this stage TLEs and data sets similar to the one I've inspected are quite enough since the algorithm is very the very premature early uh, stage of develop development it just needs a very amount a very big amount of orbits to to test and to compute as much couple as possible uh, maybe the the most important limit today for the algorithm is the um, let's say the simplified model it introduces uh, which is which is better switch circular orbits, so very, very circular orbits, so it's very small, it's interesting days, and it's, um, it is a worse behavior instead for highly eccentric orbits or with as higher eccentricity values. So I would say it's not a problem of the number um, of orbits considered, but instead the geometrical uh, characteristics. It is very uh, good for the region because as we have seen before, eccentricity is uh, there are quite small, but for example, for other types of orbits could be more tricky or there could be a bigger error. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, I have another question. Uh, yeah. Uh, like you mentioned you were looking. Um, could you tell us if there was any influence or can you draw a line from your experience in the Brooks Owen Fellowship to where you are now? I think that would be an interesting nuanced question that you want to make. Absolutely. I, the Brooke Owen Fellowship is why I am even aware of the existence of this conference in here today. I was a rookie, um, so for those who don't know, I just, um, the Brooke Owens Fellowship is a fellowship for gender minorities in aerospace. They select roughly 40 per year. I think we're on class six now. I was part of the second class of rookies. And in 2018, I interned at Bryce um, in DC and had a fantastic time well, I mean, the company's amazing, but it was in large part because I was able to learn about the breadth of the space environment that was there. Um, I saw for the first time as an undergraduate astrophysics major what there was available if for anybody who was interested in space beyond astronomy and beyond aerospace engineering courses. Um, and that really opened my eyes. I still was very in love with astrophysics and I still am. Um, so I pursued my PhD in astrophysics and that's what I'm still working on. My main focus in my thesis is all about exoplanetary dynamics. But I am very interested in how these astrophysics world and astronomy world can interface with the space industry. Um, I'm super curious about what a world where we could maybe manufacture telescopes on orbit or in other places could look like where we could have like removable instruments on a telescope that could, so you could switch out instruments really easily. Um, I'm curious about what it looks like to have telescopes in space instead of on the ground. I think that there's a lot of amazing future possibilities for astrophysics that come from collaborating with the space industry. So my time as a rookie really opened my eyes to that world and has kept me involved in that world since then. So uh, that's why a project like this is of interest to me, why I submitted the grant to NASA, why we're here doing this work. So there's a very clear line between the two, and I think it's a testament to the power of that program. So I'm, I'm giving the minute warning, which means I guess I want to thank you all very much for continuing to write your papers and making presentations. I think they were all very, very interesting. So thank you.